Carl, is it correct that you grew up in Lebanon? Sure. Yes. He got his an undergraduate degree at the American University in Beirut. And then for graduate school, he came to the University of Texas at Galveston. And at UT Galveston is one of the uh, amazing uh, premier labs uh, in pain research. And this is the laboratory of William Willis. And among the many things that uh, Dr. Willis has accomplished was, was defining the spinothalamic uh, pathway, the one that we, we consider to be a major path, the major pathway for the transduction of peripheral pain. And, um, you know, what characterizes the Willis Laboratory is a strong grounding in neuroanatomy. And uh, this is something that I think Carl uh, has a foundation in. He, as he got his PhD. He went to work with a very famous neuroscientist, uh, Stephen Waxman, at Yale University. And Dr. Waxman is uh, uh, one of the senior investigators in the Veterans Administration and made pioneering advances in many areas of neurology, but also defining critical genetic uh, components for chronic pain, sodium channel uh, channelopathies, mutations in some of the critical ion channels that are involved in the transduction of pain. Uh, Carl is already, um, uh, this year, chairing a major session on, chronic, on pain at the Society for Neuroscience. He's on an uh, editorial board of two journals. Uh, already very well funded from NIH, uh, Brown Institute for Brain Science, uh, Stryer Company Grant, and the RI uh, Foundation Grant. He also has an ambassador award from the Lifespan Executive Training Program, and which is uh, one of five awards which helps him interact with the uh, hospitals associated with Brown Medical School. He's now an uh, assistant professor at Brown, and he's focused on the issue of neuroinflammation. And He's currently on the faculty in the Department of Neuroscience and Neurosurgery. So it's very important that we have somebody with this integrated expertise and integrated views to help us synthesize everything that we've heard about today. I'll share with you uh, personal communication. This is an email, uh, one of several unsolicited emails I received on and off uh, from patients asking for uh, scientific questions, uh, asking about the literature, uh, and and some sometimes just uh, uh, sharing their experiences with me, uh, and we'll call this person Kate. And through uh, these series of emails, uh, I'm gonna um, uh, portray uh, a common experience to people with chronic pain. Uh, we'll start with a diagnosis problem. She's been diagnosed with RSD, fibro degenerative arthritis. She also suffers from cluster headaches and chronic sinus infections. Uh, she, because of that, probably she's on a cocktail of medications or because of the misdiagnosis. Uh, she has lost a lot of weight, an indication of a lot of comorbid conditions in addition to sleep deprivations and depression. Uh, she is currently seeing a neuropsychologist, not a pain specialist, and she's always been in search for a clinic or a hospital that does not uh, go the injection route, as she calls it. She goes on to say uh, throughout the weeks that She's been scheduled for gamma knife, and she's even willing to try implantable devices. She's getting desperate. Uh, her calendar is full of doctor appointments, uh, and she doesn't get enough sleep. Uh, having memory loss, and she thinks it's due to the pain medication, but she's in a cash 22, and she says she starts feeling like a gerbil spinning in a plastic ball, hoping someone stops the spinning and lets you go. And this is a problem I'm not going to burden you with statistics and numbers, more of a personal a person. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's why I shared with you that email. But on a, on a national scale, in terms of policymaking, the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies released a report on June 29th uh, acknowledging that persistent pain can cause changes in the nervous system and become a distinct chronic disease. And that Pain warrants, obviously, a higher level of attention and funding from the NIH. We hope that's going to be the case. But um, so I'm not going to add a lot of knowledge to what you've already heard from this um, excellent panel of, of speakers. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is give you a 30,000 feet uh, level uh, view of everything, try to synthesize some ideas, hoping to come across scientists and patients and people from different backgrounds alike. It's Friday, it's after dinner, and you know people have had a little bit of alcohol as well, so I'm going to try to keep it light. I've taken out all the hardcore data and kept the synthesis part of the talk. Start with the basics first. Uh, 
we heard a lot about the brain. Some people talked about the spinal cord, uh, but there was a lot of brain talk. And so how did we get interested in the brain, first place? The conceptual framework of neuroscience began with uh, Aristotelian thought, very old. It was later transformed by the Cartesian Revolution in the 17th century, and we saw a slide from Dr. Davis about that. But it's always been that the motor system was tackled before the sensory system, arguably for ease of providing empirical evidence. It was easier to cut a nerve and witness a paralysis than just uh, injure a nerve and, and validate a sensory abnormality. So Aristotle proposed that a human is a body and a soul, uh, a psyche, but that the soul has no religious connotations the way we know it today. It is not the mind, and it's not consciousness. It is that something that makes a living human out of an assembly of flesh and blood. So that body and soul are parts of a thing, such that matter and form are linked together, and one cannot exist without the other. Every matter has a form, and every form must be based on a matter. You can't have one but not the other. Gallen came in and actually postulated that there's a rational soul that's in the ventricle, so he gave it a physical locus. And here I'm not going to argue for or against. And, you know, I would love to get in a philosophical uh, uh, discussion with you, but that's not the place to do that. We could do this afterwards. But just the genealogy of our thinking. Uh, so he gave it a physical place in the ventricles. And then Nemesius said that all mental functions, not just the rational soul, are in the ventricles. And that thought extended to Avicenna, or Ibn Sina in Arabic, and Da Vinci. Uh, Jean Fernel was the first uh, to coin the word psychologia, and he postulated that the soul is immortal, uh, separate from the body, and here you know, starts the religious connotation of the soul. And then to the Cartesian world of soul now is actually equal to mind. So remember we started with a human is a body and a soul, and they're together. Now we've taken out the soul away from that formula and gave it a name, a mind, and put it in a physical space. And he actually said that the mind and the soul are united in a pineal gland in the ventricles, which you know is not true. But this actually, I mean, you could be laughing, but this extended to current days of thinking of placing the soul in, by translation, emotion and cognition to a physical space in the brain, uh, starting with Sherrington, Penfield, Eccles, and Crick, actually. And then the soul, transformed to mind, became the brain. So, again, no comments on that. The case of pain is particular. You need a nervous system to have pain, specifically C fibers. You need consciousness. If you're unconscious, there's no way you can be in pain. It is not just sensory, it's multidimensional, and it's subjective. So keep these definitions in mind. They're obvious, but keep them in mind. And it's communicable. So we've seen this before. A noxious stimulus to the finger, let's say, activates preferentially C fibers and, and nociceptors. And the signal is transmitted all the way up to the cervical cord, in the case of the hand, where before we even were aware of the stimulus and the pain, there's a reflex, monosynaptic reflex, that descends all the way in the arm and initiates a withdrawal. So pain is an alarm protective mechanism which we want to keep at any cost, the normal kind of pain. Concomitantly, there's a signal that ascends all the way up to the brain, and there's your brain. It goes all the way to a special nucleus called the thalamus, an almond-shaped structure in the middle of the brain, which is a chief sensory center for receiving signals from a painful stimulus. And we'll be focusing on that structure in a second. So my talk has the word visualizing, and we all talked about visualizing. And with visualizing comes the word uh, imaging. That's how we link these two together. And I'm not going to talk about imaging because it's been talked a lot uh, about uh, by excellent speakers before me. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually move away from the traditional imaging 
into the world of electrophysiological imaging. Uh, but neuroimaging has provided for us, um, you know, um, it allowed us to make great strides in the field. For example, it, it, it challenged the notion that uh, chronic pain is not a disease. Uh, we think it is. And it made us realize and visualize and display to our eyes how chronic pain uh, possibly changes the structure of the brain and, and causes uh, connectivity changes in the brain. So these, is, um, uh, these are uh, different brain regions that are affected under one pain condition but not the other. Complicated picture, don't worry about it. Um, but it's important for us to know that with all these, uh, with, with this list of all these brain regions, there are, there's commonality that we can draw some lessons from. Uh, and, and there's a list of commonly cited brain regions that in, uh, um, manifest with increased blood signal, uh, bold signal, uh, linked to pain. And these areas include the thalamus, which we talked about, uh, the primary somatosensory cortex, S1 and S2, for the secondary somatosensory cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, the prefrontal cortex, the insula, and for some reason the cerebellum, which I have yet to meet one person explaining to me why the cerebellum should be involved in pain. Here's a diagram that you've seen uh, over and over again, uh, simplified, in stimulus to the foot, and the signal goes up in the STT pathway discovered in Galveston, uh, all the way to the thalamus, and these are the commonly activated regions which we form what we think is a neural matrix. A fancy word, which we actually don't know what it means, but we have to call it something, so we call it neuromatrix. And these are these structures connected with each other. And we think that after peripheral nerve injury, which causes neuropathic pain, there is miscommunication between these centers, and the matrix is disrupted. And this is the best we can come up with as an explanation. Now, in addition to measuring the overall increase in the bolt signal, uh, there's been recently an effort to look at uh, fluctuations in the bolt signal. And if you run a statistical analysis uh, on the data uh, called Fourier transfer analysis, you can gather these data together and plot them as a power spectrum, a spectrum uh, versus frequencies. So this is the bolt signal fluctuations within a uh, few seconds. And again, if you run a Fourier transfer analysis, you can get this type of data, and then you can average, and you can get a heat map of those frequency. And if you do that, you get a visualization uh, different than the overall ball signal increase or decrease. Uh, this is a measure of the power spectrum of these fluctuations plotted against frequencies. And those frequencies have been divided into three uh, phases, uh, low, mid, and higher frequencies, and um, uh, they generate for you uh, uh, brain maps with, with uh, activation. Um, for example, uh, at a low frequency, you get a peak power spectrum within this range, which corresponds to these areas in the brain, and so on and so forth. And then you can plot those data for a pain population versus normal, and then you can look for changes or differences. Uh, note, however, the very low frequency ranges uh, for, for this method. We are within the maximum of 0.2 hertz frequency resolution, which is probably too low for us uh, in terms of neuronal function, uh, which happens in the millisecond ranges. So we, we've talked about human data a lot, and some people mentioned uh, animal data. Um, so this is a unique study that I picked up because they've used primates um, and they've combined imaging with electrophysiology and histology and showed us that a lot of the imaging actually makes sense, electrophysiologically speaking. Uh, so this is one monkey and this is another monkey. Uh, and this is a heat noxious stimulus applied uh, to the hand, contralateral to the somatosensory cortex. Uh, and this is tactile stimulation. And these are activation areas. And over here uh, is uh, recording, single recording from the cortex to map out the receptive fields. And this is a superimposed picture of all of these. And there seems to be high correlation between 
um, the activation areas and uh, the receptive field areas and um, the recording of these single units, which means that the bold increased signals are very much correlated uh, with the neuronal firing. Um, and these uh, images were collected using a 9.4 Tesla, a very high resolution, uh, spatial resolution. Uh, but I'm also uncomfortable with a little bit of the interpretation of the data. Uh, to note that also the tactile and heat stimuli were applied for 24, 30 seconds each, uh, for each of those to have an effect. And 30 seconds is a long time to have an effect. And in fact, some of the activations occurred within 15 uh, to, to 20 to 30 seconds after the initial onset of the stimulus. So you'd wonder what's the meaning of these activations, uh, temporally speaking. And in the interpretation of the data, and that paper was accompanied by an editorial, actually, which uh, summarized the findings as follows. Uh, painful stimuli engage multiple somatosensory areas. Okay. I would argue that these stimuli were not painful because the monkeys were under anesthesia. Right? There's no pain here. It's a high resolution fMRI and electrophysiology and histology in animals is used for objective substrates of pain and human brain mapping for the subjective pain mechanisms. And my problem is objective substrates of pain is an oxymoron. In that, in trying to bridge between the objective animal studies and the subjective pain experiments, I'm worried that we could be comparing apples and oranges. It also argues that this study opens up a number of new possibilities for pain mechanisms and treatment. And I'm wondering here about the treatment potential of this kind of studies. So the pitfalls in general for the imaging studies, um, the increased ball signals are an indirect measure of overall neuronal activity. We know this. And the data seems to be inconsistent across time and between subjects under various forms of chronic pain. This is just one example. Uh, distinct brain activation patterns between auditory and visual stimulations, but there's a blurred distinction between noxious and non-noxious somatosensory stimulations. There's another study in which the somatic physical pain, hypnotic influence, and imagery of pain all result in overlapping brain activation patterns. It is not known whether these phenomena are correlated to chronic pain or causally related to it. Uh, and this is, uh, there's a series of studies now arguing that there's a change in gray matter density, increase or decrease in gray matter density in the brain, uh, related to pain, uh, some of these changes are reversible uh, with pain therapy. And so I'd like here to argue and make a distinction between correlation and causality. We know a person called Jack and Kate. So we're in this conference, and Jack and Kate come, come in together, and we suspect there's a relationship between them. We have no proof there's anything going on between them. Now, Kate and Jack leave the room together. Okay, so we've strengthened the correlation here, but we have no causality. So what we have is bidirectional correlation, but we have no causality still. We haven't seen them together doing anything. So in this case, we have functional imaging showing us something, unidirectional, and then the pain goes away, and then the imaging goes away. It, it, it's a good correlation, but it's not causation to me. So... In visualizing, I would like to introduce the concept of electrophysiology and how it could be used to display an image of the brain uh, and, 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 and um, uh, tell us a little bit about the function of the brain. The advantages of chronic electrophysiology include uh, high temporal and spatial resolutions in the millisecond ranges, a temporal in the milliseconds, as I said, and spatial in terms of cellular uh, and intracellular sometimes resolution. It's relatively inexpensive and practical, such as for EEG. It could be applied to humans and animals, awake and anesthetized, or anesthetized. And we'll start with EEG first. So EEG measures the vertical field potentials. 
And this is one way where we could use EEG, and this is a group out of Switzerland by Jean Monod. He's a neurosurgeon. Uh, for an untrained eye, it doesn't mean anything, and even for a trained eye, it may not be capturing that meaningful information. What you do is you run that Fourier transfer analysis, um, mathematical uh, um, analysis, and then you plot the data of power uh, versus frequency in average, of course, across patients, and this is what you get. The green line is the power spectrum of normal volunteers, um, and you'll see a peak of activity in the theta and beta ranges, and then you take a, a group of uh, chronic pain patients. Uh, he calls it neurogenic pain. I'm not sure if the word applies in the United States anymore for neurogenic pain, uh, but he's in Switzerland. And so you notice first that there's a shift in the activation for, of about 2 or 3 hertz uh, backwards or leftwards, and there's a, an overactivation peak. The, 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 uh, the amplitude, the overall amplitude is increased. And the dotted line here represents the subpopulation of the subgroup of patients on no medication. And here is where the action is occurring. So this, in, this condition is under uh, eyes closed, and this condition is under eyes open. Uh, same pattern, although uh, decreased overall power. So now the patients undergo a therapeutic thalamic lesion in the ventral caudate nucleus, and they become better. And at the same time, they come back for another EEG scan. And again, the green is a normal, and this is the way they were, the red spectrum, within, um, I think, three or four months, this is where they're at. And within six months, they return almost back to normal in terms of EEG and in terms of their pain rating. My problem with this is that this population at three months already is experiencing 70% relief. And the blue one is experiencing 95% relief. So I'm not sure if this is a strict correlation uh, uh, between the pain itself or something else going on in the brain. In other words, the 70% relief is not much different than the pain, whereas the 95% relief is almost identical to the normal. The same group has done another uh, way uh, of looking at the data by combining EEG and Loretta. Uh, for the connoisseurs in the audience, that's a low-resolution electromagnetic tomography that generates maps of the brain and display for you uh, the locus of these spectral analyses, and then you can measure uh, the trend in normal green versus pain population doing the same thing again, a lesion in the thalamus, therapeutic, the patients become better, and then um, by some um, um, complicated mathematical analysis, they point to the anterior cingulate uh, cortex as being the locus of, of, um, of a decreased activation following the therapy uh, in, in a correlative uh, manner uh, with the decrease in the pain subjectivity. So I'm not going to draw conclusions from this study. I'm just uh, uh, um, uh, sharing with you ways at which we can look at the brain, visualize its function uh, by tools other than uh, um, strictly bald signals. Um, another group has actually focused on the gamma oscillations. In the previous studies, uh, we were interested in the theta and, and beta frequencies within you know, 0 to 25 hertz. Um, this group has looked at the gamma oscillations of frequencies. I have a problem with the word pain perception. I'll let you know about it later. Um, but so the gamma oscillations is between 30 and 100 hertz, and it's thought to be related to attention to painful, uh, non-painful auditory and visual stimuli. And this is what you can do with this uh, type of studies if you look at those high-frequency ranges. Uh, this is the visual activation um, uh, activation by a visual stimulus, um, and this is in response to a painful stimulus, a different pattern of activation. You have here an occipital uh, activation versus here a more uh, central um, activation pattern. Uh, and then combining this with the maximum of activation map superimposed on structural T1 MRI, you can get this visual visualization um, uh, image. And we're trying to do the same thing in rats. 
Um, uh, the problem is we don't want to anesthetize the rats, so we can have a perfectly translational potential, and we want to do non-invasive EEG. And that hasn't been done before to place EEGs uh, on a scalp of rats, um, uh, not on a skull and not intracranially, and, 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 and have a, a good uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, but I did find a study which, which used this technique, uh, and um, I think it's going to pick up soon, but we teamed up with a, a, an engineer at the University of Rhode Island. Um, uh, he has developed a tricentric uh, um, electrode. Uh, it's patented, and you place that on the scalp of the animal, and you place three of those, actually. And this is a recording uh, during spontaneous or resting uh, phase of the animal, awake, um, and this is in response to weak von Frey, the, the tactile stimulus, and a strong von Frey elicits a stronger evoked potential, and then a pinprick, which is painful, very distinct. In each one of these traces, there is an average of four, uh, five trials, actually. And this is a normal animal, and we're trying to see whether it's different from the chronic pain uh, animal or not. And we don't have data. We don't have the money to do it. But we can also run a power spectrum analysis uh, on these data, uh, and you can see peaks of, of, of uh, power spectral uh, uh, histograms within the low-frequency regions, which corresponds actually with, with the human data. By the way, the advantage of this type of, I don't want to call them biomarkers, um, but I'd like to call them predictors of a certain condition, whereby you can predict with a certain confidence level uh, whether there is pain or not. And one of the advantages is that for the pain behaviors in the animals, we mostly rely on evoked responses to heat and tactile, and it's flinching of the paw and recording all of these data, and we heard about uh, this type of, of testing from most of the speakers, actually. Uh, with the exception of, of two paradigms that test spontaneous activity in the animal. And if you think about it, uh, chronic pain patients, their main complaint is a spontaneous pain, not the one evoked by a heat or a touch um, and so we try to reproduce this in the lab, and it's very hard to interrogate the animal whether they're spontaneously having pain or not. And so uh, an exception is actually the uh, place preference test uh, discussed by Dr. Watkins yesterday, and there's another test about facial grimaces, but those tests are actually hard to set up in a lab setting. So we think a spontaneous type of EEG would actually complement existing behavioral data. Magnetoencephalography is another electrophysiological method of looking at electrical field indirectly by measuring magnetic fields, and these are tangential uh, fields. Um, and so MEG and EEG are not exactly the same thing. One measures the vertical, and the other measures the, uh, uh, um, uh, what did I call it? <laughs> I want to test your attention. Tangential magnetic field, uh, electrical fields. Thank you. And so the Rodolfo Linas group in New York uh, has taken this measure and, and collected data from a group of CRPS patients, type 2, um, and compared this to, to normal volunteers. Uh, so this is the group of normal volunteers, and this is the CRPS group. Again, this is the same type of analysis of Fourier transfer, uh, power spectral analysis density uh, versus frequency. So the control group seems to peak right about here at about 10 to 12 hertz. Uh, the CRPS uh, group peaks to the left from that, um, and the group has linked this to a phenomenon uh, they termed that thalamocortical dysrhythmia. So a pause here to put this in the context of what we learned so far. Whenever you see a peak when you run an analysis like this, it means that there's a rhythm going on in the brain. We talk about frequencies, we talk about rhythms. And there's a resting rhythm in the brain, and there's an active rhythm, and there's a rhythm for attention and not. Apparently, there's a rhythm when someone is in pain. And the rhythm is generated when different brain centers talk to each other, and they're connected, and they spike at a certain frequency that resonates for some reason. We don't know why or how, uh, but the group seems to think that this is generated by the rhythm between the thalamus, that structure in the, in the center of the brain, with the cortex. So there's ongoing back and forth communication that generates this rhythm, and this rhythm is upset under chronic pain conditions. The question is why, and we don't know why, but I'll try to um, uh, advance some hypotheses for you. 
in a second. So this is what I just said. Pitfalls. Uh, the MEG is bulky, expensive, and limited to low frequency ranges. And so we move now to single unit recordings from the brain. It's a technique whereby uh, invasively, you know, you have to insert an electrode in the brain and record the activity from single neurons. So compare this to imaging, whereby imaging is indirect, you're measuring uh, blood dynamics, um, which we think is related to neuronal activity, and compare this to the glial field, whereby you disrupt or manipulate glia, and you have a secondary behavioral effect, but all of these need to be channeled, ultimately, through neuronal function. Um, and neuronal function uh, is governed by action, action potential firing, which we we'll call spiking. If a neuron does not fire, you're either dead, or you don't feel, or you're paralyzed. No matter what the glia are doing, and uh, no matter what you measure uh, with, with a bolt signal, a neuron has to fire. So we're after the mechanisms of what is making the neurons fire differently or more. So single unit activity in the thalamus. It's been known in humans that it's, if you record from single neurons in the thalamus of patients with chronic pain, uh, overall they have increased spontaneous neuronal firing, and these are awake individuals. They're scheduled for neurosurgery for um, either an implant uh, of a stimulating device uh, or their uh, epilepsy patient uh, who happen to have pain, uh, and this is how most of these data are gathered. Uh, they have increased evoke responses to the stimuli. So spontaneously, they're fighting like crazy. And then you now come and evoke the responses on a painful limb by touching or brushing, and now they have an increased response. In addition to this, there's an abnormal burst. And this is a very important point because we tend to think in a linear fashion because it's simple, we like it, this is how we are. It's up, down. If it's not up or down, then nothing has changed. But that's not really how it is in the nervous system. If you take about one second uh, period, and within this one second you have 10 spikes, this could be in an epilepsy patient or any disease. And then you take a normal individual, within, the, within this one second you also have 10 spikes. It doesn't mean that the two situations are uh, similar because the timing of those spikes is very important. And here's where the time resolution is key to understanding what's going on. In other words, you may not necessarily have an increase or decreased bold, or increase or decreased overall rate of firing, but it's the timing of the spikes that matters. Because if the timing is misaligned, you'll miss the resonance and you'll miss the rhythmicity of, of, of the communication between different brain centers. So specifically for the interlaminar uh, thalamus, uh, for deafferentation pain, and this is work by Fred Lenz at Hopkins, again, high rate, rhythmic, bursts, and the changes in the patterns of firing are more indicative than the existence of firing, uh, of, of burst in itself. Because there are patients with spinal cord injury, deafferentation, with no pain, who do exhibit burst. So it's not the occurrence of burst, it's the shape and the pattern of the burst. Again, visual is always uh, important. Um, this is a recording from a single neuron in thalamus of a patient with uh, root injury, the affrontation pain, um, the uh, dotted lines represent the time when the hand that hurts of the patient is, is probed, um, and the solid line represents the time when the patient experiences the pain, and notice how the cell now is fighting rhythmically. When the pain stops, the rhythmicity stops, and here it goes again. Now compare this with this. This is a rat in a thalamus with deafferentation pain under anesthesia, and the cell here seems to enter different phases of rhythmicity spontaneously. So we call all of these uh, phenomena sensitization. And there's sensitization all across the neuroaxis, arguably for pain in the spinal cord, but also in the brain. And today's talk is about the brain, so I'll focus on sensitization in the thalamus. And again, the best way is not only visualization, it's also auditory, so there's a clip for you. And we have here an electrode in the thalamus of a rat in pain. And this period here, nothing is happening, we're not touching the animal. After this cursor here, we start brushing the foot of the animal. 
which arguably projects to the thalamus. And the cell fires, and we can plot this histogram here, and the rate of firing here is 20 hertz. And this is what you hear in the lab. So these are the spikes. And we capture any one, every one of those, and we plot a histogram. Normal. And this is what you see in a chronic pain animal. To start with, the firing is at 40 hertz before we touch the animal. And then when you brush the foot, it goes up to 80 hertz. And this is the brushing now. So it's almost going crazy. So this is what's going on in the brain of the rat. And now we look for clues. Because so far, all we have is a relationship, a correlation. We get to the mechanisms in a second. And this is when you plot the data on a population level, and you notice that the response to brush and pressure and pinch are elevated significantly for a, a number of animals. Uh, and if you record from neurons that have receptive fields outside of the injured leg, they're almost normal, except for brushing. There seems to be an increased response to brushing all over the body, uh, but normal responses to other stimuli for the rest of the body that have no relationship with the injured uh, uh, foot. So th the data I showed you was in a model of sciatic injury, peripheral nerve injury, peripheral neuropathic injury, and this is the same thing in a model of spinal cord injury. So patients with spinal cord injury, more than 50% of them, in addition to the paralysis, have chronic pain, devastating, um, of unknown origin. And you get the same thing again. And go back now to the sciatic pain model, uh, spontaneously, again, we see here that the cell enters into this rhythmic phase of firing. In trying to find out where is this coming from, we then transect the spinal cord. Okay. So we're recording from the brain, and the, this cell responds to whatever you do to the foot, and now you cut the spinal cord, so it's receiving no more communication from lower body. Still, the spontaneous firing is very high, but the oscillation disappears. So we tend to think that that oscillation is driven or needs the periphery and the injured nerve, but that the high spontaneous fighting is inherent to the brain. It doesn't need the periphery. Once it's established, um, it's in the brain. We've looked at burst, and the incidence of burst is in, was increased in the sciatic neuropathy model in those cells as well. Uh, same thing happens in the spinal cord injury model. Um, you get this high spontaneous fighting in the thalamus, and now you transect the spinal cord above the injury level of the spin initial spinal cord. Uh, you, before the transection, you're able to elicit the fighting by brush. After transection, the brush response disappears, but you're left with this high spontaneous background fighting of the cell, which, again, seems to be inherent to the thalamus. So we've looked at sensitization in several pain models, uh, spinal cord injury, sciatic um, neuropathy, but also diabetic neuropathy. So we seem to think there's something universal about the pain signal, which is independent from the model. And in, uh, during diabetic uh, neuropathy, again, uh, you have here the response of the cell to brush pressure and pinch in the thalamus. In a diabetic neuropathy model, all these responses increased, but also Interestingly, when the brush terminates and ceases um, to affect the limb, there's ongoing discharges. This is what we call uh, after discharge. Mechanisms. Again, what I've shown you so far is correlation. Uh, we need to provide um, evidence for necessary and sufficient conditions for what we're seeing. And so I'd like to propose here a couple of uh, uh, hypotheses. Um, at a um, molecular level and at a cellular level. We've heard about microglia, but most of uh, Dr. Watkins' talk was uh, uh, related to the spinal cord level. Uh, we do the brain. Um, and our work was inspired by Dr. Watkins' work, by the way. And the sodium channel work is a story that developed in the Waxman's lab, and we still carry on with this uh, work. This is not to exclude other possible mechanisms. This is a great review that 
uh, summarizes the list of changes that could occur in different areas of the brain, which could be mediated by you know an, 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 a wide array of things, ranging from long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, uh, ERK signaling, uh, cannabinoid receptors, um, dopamine receptors in the thalamus, uh, sodium channels, amygdala, striatum, hypothalamus. These are uh, changes in the rat, by the way. So obviously there's no time to talk about all of these today, so we just focus about what I know most and what makes more uh, most sense and corroborated by not just our lab but different labs and multiple studies in our lab. We'll start with the sodium channel uh, story. How much time do I still have? 15? 10? 5? 4? 3? 2? Okay. Um, so we, we focus on the 1.3 channel because it's, um, it's a voltage-gated sodium channel. It rapidly reprimes, meaning it permits high firing frequency of, of the neuron compared to normal. Um, it, it's uh, expressed uh, in embryonic levels, but it's not supposed to be expressed under normal conditions in the adult CNS spinal cord and brain. And we see that after a spinal cord uh, injury that it's now abnormally expressed in the thalamus where it's not supposed to be in neurons and not in other cells. Uh, it's also expressed from the sciatic uh, nerve injury, also in the thalamus, so two types of uh, pain models. Other sodium channel types are not expressed in the thalamus. Uh, so this is the sodium channel story in terms of correlation. Microglia, correlation-wise, uh, we've heard about these things, but I just want to uh, say a few words about the word activation, which is being used rather loosely in the field. Microglia are activated when they adopt a spectrum of things, a, a spectrum of, of, of phenotypes, ranging from increased expression of the markers we saw, their shape, the fact that they secrete cytokines, the fact that they proliferate, uh, and the fact that they migrate in vivo. Uh, all of these things mean that microglia are activated. You cannot select one thing and say that microglia are activated. And so this is creating confusion in the field because the microglia could be expressing a lot of receptors but not secreting anything. Therefore, it doesn't matter what they're expressing if they're not affecting the neurons. Uh, so microglia in the thalamus after spinal cord injury are upregulated uh, at week, starting week two after injury, which is correlated with uh, the, the pain sensitivity of the animals. Uh, we've recently shown that they're activated similarly uh, in the rat model after sciatic neuropathy, so again, two different models, and they're co-expressed with P38 signaling pathway in the thalamus. And I need to mention here a study in 2004 that actually showed microglia and the brain are not activated in a particular uh, injury model, which was not mentioned by Dr. Watkins yesterday. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know um, much about um, why this is the case and that we're trying to reconcile these data. All I can say is that they've used a different injury model, it's a mouse, but also they only counted the number of microglia. They judge activation of microglia by their numbers, but not by what they're doing or what they're expressing, which seems to be a confounding variable in the field. I also have to mention these two studies in general neuroscience by a different group who've definitely shown that there's microglial activation in the brainstem in contradiction to the review study and the work that we've done before. Uh, so I had to mention that study for the records. Uh, so evidence for causality, if you inject an antisense and knock down that protein in the thalamus, the 1.3 channel that I talked to you about, sensitization goes away and pain becomes better in the animal. So we've increased our correlation confidence a bit by making something disappear and the pain goes away for the sodium channel. And that's a conclusion. Now, for the spinal cord injury uh, model, it's an interesting story. Uh, uh, the Haynes group have shown increased expression of a chemokine signal that's secreted by microglia, which is called CCL21. Uh, um, it's expressed um, <coughs> in, um, in, in, I'm sorry, it's, it's expressed in neurons uh, below the level of injury um, of, in the spinal cord uh, injury model. And... If you antagonize that signal in the thalamus, pain goes away and the sensitization of thalamic neurons goes away and the pain behavior goes away. And um, I'll summarize this in a second in a sketch diagram. But before I, I move on, if you inject monocycline, which is a microglia inhibitor, in the thalamus of rats with sciatic pain, 
uh, you reverse microglia activation and you get rid of the pain. And this is uh, the conclusion we'll draw from, from this. Um, beyond the thalamus, another group has recently shown that neurons in the cortex now, the somatosensory cortex, have increased spontaneous firing and increased evoked potentials and a weird burst activity going on in the cortex. So we don't know where this is going to end. It starts in the spinal cord, sensitization. The word starts is inaccurate. We've, we've discovered it in the spinal cord. We've just recently discovered it in the thalamus, and now we're seeing it in the cortex. Mechanisms unknown for the cortex, somewhat known for the thalamus. The signal CCL21 um, is a signal that is emanating from the spinal cord below the lesion level. It goes up all the way to the thalamus, activates microglia, and then it starts a feedback loop between microglia and neuron and initiates the pain. If you'll block this, you can block the neuropathic manifestation in the animal. For the case of the peripheral nerve injury, you get microglia activation in the spinal cord and the secondary one in the VPL thalamus, as we've seen. The signaling from here to here is unknown. From here to here is some unknown. From here to here is unknown. Again, uh, why this is happening in the brain? Is it because it's inherent in the brain or because of spinal cord drive is still unknown? So the last uh, part of my talk is additional evidence for causality direct targeted intervention by deep brain stimulation as a neurotechnology approach. DBS is FDA approved for motor disorders. The approval for pain has been rescinded in the late 90s. <clears throat> Low side effects arguably, although it's invasive obviously, you need to get to the brain and the spinal cord. But once you get beyond this, it has low side effect uh, profile. Tremendous technological advancement for motor disorders, and I'll explain that in a second. So DBS, don't be fooled by the fancy uh, slide. It's nothing but a wire inserted in the brain connected to a battery. It stimulates neurons in ways we don't know how or why. Um, general principles that it drives forward energetic systems. So you have a pain condition and you want to cure it, so you drive forward an analgesic system, and that's why I call it deep brain stimulation. We have an alternative explanation so that a certain frequency could actually jam neuronal circuitry. And if this is true, then it's not called DBS anymore. It's called DBM or deep brain modulation because depending on the frequency, you get drive forward the neuron or shut it down. And if you use a high frequency stimulation paradigm, 100 to 200 hertz, this is what happens, and we've tested this hypothesis. Um, this is what's used in the clinic actually for motor disorders. And we just adopted the same thing for pain. If you do this, you drop the rate of uh, firing of thalamic neurons after DBA, uh, DBS at high frequency in a voltage-dependent uh, manner uh, with voltage increments of, of 0.5 volts on a group level. It has a terrific effect on the firing pattern of neurons. They still fire, but at a normal rate. Low frequency stimulation doesn't do anything except maybe for elevating spontaneous fighting a bit. And then there's the burst story. Uh, burst means different things to different people, so you have to set up parameters. Uh, interval between two spikes, uh, in these intervals, once they're set, you come up with this profile of the circles indicate normal bursts uh, and spontaneous or evoked to brush and painful and pressure. Uh, they're all increased in the black squares, which are the chronic pain models. And after DBS, they're all reversed back to normal. So we're sort of reversing the abnormal burst in these animals. Similar pattern when you look at the percent spikes within a burst, how many spikes are contained within a burst, which is important. Same thing, but in the opposite direction for the mean interburst uh, time. And we've collected almost 12 panels of ways of looking at burst Almost eight of the 12 panels are reversed by DBS at a high frequency. And we've even selected a particular paradigm for stimulating, whereby it's possible to have current steering. Instead of putting one wire and have a spherical electrical field, we use two wires placed such that they actually make up an oval shape, inclined to overlap maximally with the VPL structure minimally with other surrounding tr structures of the thalamus. And if you do this, you actually reverse the thermal hyperalgesia in the animal. Um, 
um, in, in both uh, feet, though. So it seems that if you stimulate on one side in the thalamus, you can have effects bidirectionally, and we don't know why this is the case. It's insignificant for the normal uh, leg, but it's significant for the pain leg. <clears throat> So mechanisms, we think that high frequency mimics the functional effects of ablation without killing the structure, obviously, which we call jamming. Um, it could also activate analgesic structures like traditionally thought. It could be blockade of anal, uh, uh, membrane ion channels, synaptic exhaustion, induction of early genes, or even neurogenesis, as was shown by the Lozano group um, recently. We really don't know what's happening, but we're just starting to resurrect a method which works some of the times, but we don't know how. And when it doesn't work, we still don't know how. We just want to make it more uh, efficient and try to understand the cellular mechanisms of that. Uh, in summary, uh, visualizing brain function, is it really a matter of taking a closer look? Will higher resolution actually manifest to us a certain brain function that was concealed prior to the low resolution image? And is it really with high resolution and spatial and temporal, we'll be able to actually understand better the, the function of the overall brain, not just in terms of pain, but in terms of uh, cognitive and motor functions? Or have we really embarked on a journey to the East or West Pole? Um, evidently, we need to integrate human and animal data, a question that I asked earlier today. Human pain is the ultimate reference. And the animal studies allow for intervention and practical lab testing. You know, you can't really try different frequencies on humans and slice their brain up and look for sodium channels that easily. So there's things that you could do with humans as the ultimate reference. But then when you want to put a, an animal in a magnet, it needs to be anesthetized, and then, you know, apples and oranges. So we need to be careful about these things. Uh, the sensory and cognitive systems in general still lag behind the motor system. And I believe that neurotechnology has something to offer in that regard, and we can learn for, from the motor um, uh, field. Uh, so at Brown, they pioneered a sensor technology intracranially, which now transmits wirelessly, which has allowed them to transform thoughts into action. So these are paralyzed individuals due to spinal cord injury, and some of them are actually in a vegetative state, completely paralyzed. They can't even open or close their eyes. Inserting a chip in their motor cortex and programming their computers, transmit wirelessly to a computer, and now the computer helps them write emails, uh, move a prosthetic arm, or even move uh, a wheelchair. And they're completely paralyzed again. So some of these patients can communicate for the first time in their lives, maybe in 10 years. So this is pioneered by Brown, and I'm standing there thinking, the pain field is sort of like in the dark ages compared to the motor field. And there's something must be done about this. Uh, eventually, our hope is that one day we could feed in those signals that we're looking for, whether imaging or EEG or what have you, or thermal, uh, and connect them to a therapeutic agent, which could be a stimulator or a drug infusion pump, and therefore closing the loop between a sensor and a stimulator an automatic fashion, the doctor is out of the picture, and the patient doesn't even need to control that machine. It's a closed-loop system, and hopefully bringing those patients out of their gerbil uh, uh, state.